Coming up on Destination Vienna, we look at the runners and riders attempting to make the Euro 2008 final in Vienna. We profile their chances and take a look at the venues where they'll be playing. Starting with Group A. Turkey made a dream start to their qualifying campaign, winning their first four matches. But when Fatih Tirim's men drew with Norway, lost to Bosnia, and could only manage a draw in Malta, the Turkish challenge looked off the rails. Terim was feeling the pressure. Media is important. Sport, media is very important. But I think it's in my country a little bit more and uh, pressure. Uh, but I'm a very experienced. I'm a habit for the, some things. But what can I do? What we can do? Uh. A journey to the other end of Europe would decide Turkey's fate. When Terim's squad arrived in Oslo, the capital of Norway, the freezing conditions weren't the only obstacle. Norway were in the driving seat, two points ahead of Turkey on the eve of the match. A win or even a draw, and it would almost certainly be Norway and not Turkey qualifying for Euro 2008. No way, no way! 2 no. <laughs> The day before the game, and all seemed well in the Norway camp. Coach Aga Hareide and his team confident of making their first Euros since 2000. The mood may have been relaxed, but everyone was well aware of how much the game would mean. I think uh, being in the, um, in, a, in a final tournament uh, with all the other good nations in Europe would be fantastic for, for our young players and also for the whole nation. Welcome to this crucial game in the European Championship qualifying Group C. It will decide whether Norway or Turkey qualify for the tournament next summer. And there's a flick on, there's a chance here! Oh, that's the start they wanted! And who is it buried under that pile of players? That's Eric Hagen. Oh, he struck that well! Oh, what a strike by the Newcastle player! Has he caught Hakon Opdal not paying full attention? Nobody expected him to strike from there. Gokin Ganu, the right back. Oh, it's a good strike, and they've scored, it's Turkey! And it's number eight, Nihat Kabeci. And Turkey have come back from 1-0 down to lead two goals to one here in Norway. Norway could have qualified if they had taken the three points tonight. Turkey having been a goal down in 12 minutes, coming back to score twice and take the lead. And that surely will be that, and that's it! It's a memorable victory for Turkey. They've beaten Norway here in Oslo by two goals to one, but disappointment etched on the faces of these Norwegian players. So the final score here is Norway one, Turkey two. That was the crucial win for Turkey. They'd performed when it mattered, and after a routine win over Malta, secured qualification. The host for three games in Group A, Geneva is the main metropolis of French-speaking Switzerland, with a population of nearly half a million people. But you'll hear a lot more than French spoken by the sides of Lake Geneva. This is one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world. Geneva is simply an international city, so there's a real blend of cultures. You can meet people from lots of different countries here. On the whole, people are pretty sociable. For Euro 2008, Turkey, the Czech Republic and Portugal will play in Geneva. All at the 30,000 capacity stadium that's home to local club Servette.
Games here include a potentially explosive encounter on the opening day, Portugal against Turkey. Next up from Group A, the Czech Republic. Surely we can't still be calling the Czech Republic the dark horses of the competition. So often they've arrived with that tag, but this time they won't be so easily dismissed. Four years ago in Portugal, the Czechs reached the semi-finals and were regarded by some as the best team in the tournament. Yet it's been a turbulent couple of years for the current Czech squad. Retirements, injuries and poor form have been hard to overcome. But there are signs that the team are beginning to gel. This is uh, a bit different, a different uh, squad. They have uh, different uh, strength uh, points and uh, differ different weak weakness, weaknesses. But I think uh, this is a good, a good side uh, which is able to go through the group. And the Czechs do love the European Championships. They actually won the tournament back in 1976, then as Czechoslovakia. And more recently, they were losing finalists at England's Euro 96. I believe that we can build on the achievements of the past, be they 1996 or the last European Championships in Portugal. And I believe that everybody wants it to get as far as possible. Vladimir Smitser was part of that 96 side. He knows better than anyone just how far the nation have come since then. So it's no longer a case of the Czech Republic underdogs. I think... Uh... In 1996, we, we were not under pressure. Nobody expected us to do something well, you know. But now, I think at the moment, our team, the players are under more pressure because uh, they are playing for the big teams, you know. They are playing AC Milan, you know, and this type of the Chelsea, you know. And so the, the fans, they are expecting more from our team and that's a that's big difference. They made a steady start to their qualifying campaign too. Three wins in their first three games had the fans confident of an easy passage to the Euros, even if the management were rather more cautious. We had some concerns, but we were all convinced that the team was strong enough to do it. And I don't think this happened by chance, or that our opponents were poor. Bruckner's team travelled to Germany in October 2007, knowing a win would see them through. Germany may have already qualified, but they were in imperious form. That game in Germany was very important for us. Under those sort of circumstances, there is something in the Czech temperament that when such a key game or something important is approaching, the team manages to unite and pull together. Pull together is exactly what they did do, and in spectacular fashion. Despite missing several key players, the new generation put the Euro 2008 favourites to the sword with a devastating display. They ran out 3-0 winners, and it could have been more. Bruckner's faith in his young charges had proved well justified. I remember it well, because I started my first game in the main lineup in that match. For the first goal, Placid passed the great ball to Honza Koller, and then he set up Sionko, who scored into an empty net. Matioski made a great run into the box, dodged two players, and stuck it in the net past Hildebrand. And as for the third goal, I had something to do with that one. I set up Plasil, who was in the box on his own. He got past the defender and slipped the ball past Hildebrand. Well, we fell back on our last results and defensive performances. And we haven't let in any goals in the last five qualifying matches. But I didn't think that we would come away from Germany with a clean sheet. We won and the Germans were helpless. We were just fantastic.
That result went a long way towards ensuring qualification. The Czech Republic ended up top of Group D, just edging out the Germans. Coming up, we check out the co-hosts, Switzerland, looking to impress on the pitch and to put on the party of a lifetime off it. But first from Group A, Euro 2004 runners-up Portugal, determined to go one better this time around. Portugal are rightly among the favourites to win Euro 2008. They may have left it until the last game to ensure qualification, but there's no denying they have the stars and the talent for the big occasion. Their record in recent major events is good, but still no trophy. Perhaps this time, they can finally turn potential into success. It's definitely possible that Portugal can win it. And it's a title we've been trying to get for a long time now. Portugal will go to Austria and Switzerland only thinking about a podium finish because their recent record means they should think this big. The golden generation of Luis Figo and Rui Costa is over. Youngsters like Manchester United's Nani and teammate Cristiano Ronaldo now shoulder the responsibility. The younger players are that little bit older now and so more mature like Cristiano Ronaldo, who's much better. But there's been a big change in players, with the likes of Figo no longer around. And that makes a big difference. They lost some very important and experienced players after the World Cup. These were guys who had a lot of influence on the group, a really positive influence. The 2006 World Cup was Figo's swan song. He left with 127 caps and a wealth of experience that perhaps may be missing from this side. More than anything, Portugal miss Figo's leadership. We lack a leader like Rui Costa or Figo. We really miss that. Figo's captaincy has been so sorely missed that Portugal fan George Caldeiras has set up a petition to try to persuade the midfield maestro out of retirement. We miss his leadership and his technical ability, but more than anything, we miss his experience and maturity. We'll need it one more time, one last time for Portugal to enjoy an even better European Championships. With Figo out of the picture, Portugal haven't needed to look too far for a new source of inspiration, of course. In Cristiano Ronaldo, they possess potentially the best player in the world. Obviously, in the last two or three years, I've come on a great deal in every way. I think I'm a more mature player now, a more intelligent player. I know when to make the right decisions. I feel a complete player now, but I've still got a lot to learn. Still time to develop. All I want to do is to continue in the same way I've been playing, and I just hope to get better and better. At just 23, Ronaldo has already won over 50 caps and scored more than 20 goals for Portugal. He looks set to break every record possible in his nation's colours. In terms of stature, he's different to any other player. What I'm saying is he's got this incredible explosiveness, such quality. You can see he's really ambitious and driven too. His technical ability is perfect, and he plays with such joy. He's always looking to take risks. Portugal's qualification hopes came down to their final game at Porto's Estadio do Dragão. They needed at least a draw against a Finland side inspired by veteran forward Yari Litmanen. Scalari was in bullish mood. 
importante também é só é obter o resultado. The important thing is the result. A classificação. Então, the result and qualification. Vamos fazer o possível. I've said this to you thousands of times before. We'll do everything within our powers to make that happen and achieve qualification. That's our objective. It was nervy stuff, but Portugal held on for a goal straw, a scoreline that saw them qualify behind Poland in Group A. Regarded as Switzerland's third city, Basel is situated on the banks of the River Rhine in the north of the country. With a total population of more than 700,000, the city is a real football town, with local team FC Basel consistently one of the nation's top clubs. Welcome to Basel! St. Jakob Park is a 42,500 seater venue especially enlarged for the Euros. Normally home to FC Basel is the biggest and most impressive ground in Switzerland. Most of the time it's a really good atmosphere there. You go there A to watch the game, but also B to, to meet friends, have a beer with them, eat a sausage and uh, have a good time. In addition to Switzerland's three group games, Basel will also host two quarter-finals and a semi-final. Next up, Switzerland in a group that perhaps doesn't make easy reading. It's a land of towering alpine peaks and majestic mountain lakes. Switzerland has some of the most inspiring, iconic scenery in the world. This is where many thousands of Europe's football fans will be heading this summer and by those peaceful lakes, there's going to be a Euro 2008 party to remember. Ole! 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 Switzerland! 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 Up cheap! Up cheap! Up cheap! Up cheap! Switzerland! Switzerland! So from Geneva in the west to Basel, Bern and Zurich in the north, Switzerland will be welcoming hundreds of thousands of fans to its cities, and they'll be following some of the finest footballing talent in Europe. The Swiss themselves are ready for a festival of football. I'm convinced that the party at this tournament can be just as good as the World Cup in Germany. And I know that the Swiss people have proved that they're ready to give it everything they've got. In the World Cup it was just amazing, the Swiss final was just great. And I think that the competition in Switzerland is going to be amazing. And I hope that the Austrian too. But I'm just going to tell you that the atmosphere in Switzerland is amazing, so I hope it will be like that. No competitive matches for Jakob or Kobe Kuhn's Swiss side since Germany 2006 has meant an added significance for friendly matches. Playing big opponents like Argentina and Brazil has been vital for preparation. All of the matches are important. I've always said that the friendly games are like qualifying matches anyway. They're a great chance for the players to prove themselves and compete for a place in the team. Now we are 13th, 14th in the FIFA ranking, so we have to keep it that way. We have to take those games as a competition game because we know that we don't have the same game as the other team, so we have to take like those games very seriously to prepare well for the, for the championship. There was no need to worry about the competitive edge when Switzerland were invited to Innsbruck to take on their neighbours and co-hosts, Austria. For us it's about the prestige. At the moment, and on paper, we're favourites. And we're really looking forward to this game, as the rivalry is always big with our neighbours, and we really want to win. Matches like this were particularly welcome for both Austria and Switzerland. 
They may be co-hosts in neighboring countries, but this was never going to be a harmless friendly. It's a special match because it's like be between the two teams who like, you know, organize the, the European Championship, so it's a bit of a rivality in that game. But I think that is a, is a game that we have to take very seriously because I know it's a friendly, but we want to win every game, so it's going to be a tough game. It proved to be the exacting test that the two sides were looking for. Switzerland went down 2-1 to a resurgent Austrian team. Marco Strella did manage a consolation goal, but the Austrians gave their neighbours plenty to think about. We're always glancing over Austrian football. That's certainly true. And in every match, we have to prove ourselves and the progress we've made. That goes for the Austrians as well as the Swiss. From those Swiss mountains to the four hosting cities, the countdown to June the 7th has begun. Then the hosts take on the Czech Republic in Basel. Great excitement here about the whole event. But as for Swiss chances... We are a great team, we are a young team, and we are winning the championship 2008. No, I don't think so, but maybe... No chance. <laughs> Uh, maybe. It really depends on the first matches, you know. All this atmosphere develops through the year, uh, the matches. And uh, if they do well in the beginning, then they'll do well. Then you'll really have a good atmosphere here. And then the Swiss will be very good and they'll go far, maybe to the final. Some fans optimistic then, but what about the coach, Kobe Kuhn? What does he expect? We proved in the World Cup that we're really capable of playing against the best in the world. I think in this European Championships, Switzerland could even go for the title because we have to get as far as possible. Coming up, it's Austria's turn to play host to the cream of Europe. But are they good enough to shine in their own European Championships? For 2006, Germany were host to the world. This time, they're concentrating solely on football and, for many, favourites to go all the way at Euro 2008. German fans have a sense of victory in Austria and Switzerland, and it's a feeling they should recognise. No other nation has made more appearances or won the European Championships more times than they have. And after successfully hosting the 2006 World Cup and reaching the semi-finals, Germany are confident they can go all the way this time. It's not that far from Germany to Austria or Switzerland. In this way, it could be similar to playing at home, because we'll have plenty of German support. And we hope that it will be a similar football celebration. Team spirit will only have been furthered by the results the national team have been producing. Germany took the qualifying tournament by storm and were the first side to make it to Euro 2008. But few expected such positive results so quickly. We're all surprised about the development of this team. Firstly at the World Cup and how they carried themselves as a young side. And now how they've proven themselves in the final qualification matches, especially away from home. It was a real surprise. No one would have believed that we'd have qualified three games before the end of the campaign. This isn't a German side relying on their traditional attributes of defence and organisation either. Löw has instilled an offensive mentality in his squad and the results have been breathtaking. They scored over 35 goals in qualifying, including a 13-nil thrashing of San Marino. They've tried to apply a system, and with the success of this, their confidence has grown. Through confidence, they've scored goals, and then Germany have become unstoppable. San Marino may not be the toughest opponents, but fluid Germany tore them apart, home and away. Karanje, Janssen, Frings, Gomez and Fritz were the scorers in the 6-0 home success. And a new attractive style of football for German fans to savour. We've been seeing a type of football that we can really enjoy. It's an attacking, technical, superior type of football. Similar to teams like Barcelona, Manchester United and Arsenal. 
the ones who've set the tone of world football, the ones that show us how we have to play the game. The closest the Germans come to having a star player is perhaps Chelsea's Michael Ballack, but his form and fitness have proved a genuine concern. In the last two years, the German skipper has spent more time in the stands than out on the pitch. What happened with Balak was a mystery, a secret. We didn't know what was going on with his health or when he was able to play football again. It says so much about the nature of this team that they've coped pretty well without him. A scrappy nil-nil draw in Ireland in October 2007 ensured their qualification and also showed that Germany had the heart for a fight. Now for the real pressure of the Euros. Can they handle the expectation of being tournament favourites? The weakness is that they are maybe not 100% there yet. And you could see against Ireland that the way they played wasn't perfect. But even when things aren't running smoothly on the pitch, they still fight and they still support each other. The team spirit is good. But this side aren't yet the finished article. Perhaps the Germans had a timely reminder of their failings in the latter stages of qualifying. A heavy defeat to the Czech Republic in Munich underlined there's still plenty of room for improvement in the coming months. With goals from Sionko, Matijowski and Plazil, the Czechs managed to humble their hosts by three goals to nil. They may have already qualified at that point, but when you play for Germany, defeat is never acceptable in any form. We really must play every match as if it were our last. This can't happen to us in the future. Indeed, that result meant that Germany ended up finishing second in their group, but still with their only loss coming after qualification was secured. A venue for Group B, Klagenfurt is the capital of Carinthia province in the south of Austria. It's close to the borders with Slovenia and Italy. And according to local legend, the town was founded after a man defeated a dragon known as the Lindwurm. Nowadays, you can still see the dragon all over Klagenfurt, as this is the city's emblem. Welcome to Klagenfurt. <laughs> We have a very beautiful uh, downtown and old city. The city is uh, uh, older than 800 years and we have very beautiful surroundings. The Lake Wörthersee, one of the most beautiful lakes in Austria and this lake is uh, really a Mediterranean lake. For the lucky ones with a ticket, Klagenfurt will host their three matches at the Wörthersee Stadium. The 30,000-seater is brand new and it was built especially for the tournament. We are very proud uh, to be one of the host cities. Uh, very proud and we are looking forward to the games. And here in Klagenfurt we'll play uh, Germany, Poland and Croatia. So I think we will have uh, very exciting games here in Klagenfurt. Yes, and in particular that match between Germany and Poland on June the 8th. Next up, from Group B, the co-hosts, Austria. It was a proud moment for Austria as they were chosen as co-hosts for Euro 2008 with Switzerland. The country has a long football tradition, qualifying for the World Cup an impressive eight times. But incredibly, they've never taken part in the European Championships before. Now they have the chance both to host the tournament and participate. An opportunity to shine both on and off the field. It's a, it's a very big honor for us and also for the players. And uh, we should be proud that uh, such a big tournament uh, is in Austria and in Switzerland. As qualification for the tournament was automatic for Austria and Switzerland, friendlies have been the only means of preparation for the last two years. The two played each other back in October of 2006, and it turned out to be a real test for coach Hickersberger. My own um, thinking is that 
that um, Josef Fickersberg is not a coach who can motivate the people hey! because he's really also in the interviews he's really really boring a little bit and so I don't know if he's the right man I hope so but I'm not sure with regional pride at stake and a serious need for some competitive football the game was pretty lively Austria opened the scoring from the penalty spot through Roland Lenz and then went two goals ahead when Sanel Kulic headed in Switzerland managed a consolation goal late on through Marco Strella, but the home side held on for the win. Austria do have some talented individual players who play in Europe's top leagues, but the captain is clear on what's needed from the squad if they are to succeed. If uh, we think, yeah, just one player can win a game, and uh, then we, we are not uh, successful for sure. So we have to become a team to get closer and uh, to know each other better and uh, that will be very important for us. And there's always the significant advantage of playing at home. The last few major tournaments have shown us that the host nation has always been very successful. This can give you a lot of confidence and if we can play like other teams have been able to, then it can have a good outcome. As befits European Championship debutants, Austria are under no illusions as to the size of the task that awaits them. In my opinion, the European uh, tournament is, uh, from the quality, higher than the World Cup. Because they are really very good uh, teams uh, in the European uh, Championship. And uh, I, I expect a, a, a high performance uh, from all the teams and uh, also from us. You'd have to say it would be a major shock if Austria were to be one of the finalists at their own Ernst Happel Stadium on June the 29th. But then again, the European Championships can throw up a few surprises. Greece showed us in 2004 how to do it as an outsider and that you can win the European title. Of course, it's very, very difficult, but it's in our hands. Coming up, Poland's first appearance at the Euros. Eagerly awaiting this summer's tournament and determined to be no pushovers. At first, we profile an emerging generation from Croatia, a talented young team hoping to take Group B and Euro 2008 by storm. Croatia had made it to the finals. We want to prove that uh, we are a small country, but uh, we play better football than the big guys like England, France. Spain and so on. Maybe a small country, but uh, very, very big in heart, and especially in football. It's our mentality. Yes. We just don't recognize defeat or anything else. We will win it. Of course. Of course. <laughs> of course we will win. Under young coach Slaven Bilic, Croatia's route to qualification had gone relatively smoothly, winning nine out of their 12 games and losing just once to Macedonia in their penultimate match. Bobby. A young side with plenty of promise had excited many on their journey. By the time the team travelled to London to face England, they had already made it to Euro 2008. So with no pressure on their shoulders, this would be a chance to show the world their talent. <laughs> As for England, well, they themselves needed a point still to qualify. But this Croatian team were determined to make the most of their trip to Wembley and their moment in the spotlight. I know I am, I'm sure I am, I'm England till I die. We're going to be ready. I don't know what result may come, but we're going to try to 
we're going to try to stop them coming to us in waves and we're going to try to be as dangerous as possible to score a goal and I think we have good chances. A rousing anthem had the Croatian blood pumping and the team were ready. It's a great game for us, it's a big test for us. We are representing our country, we are playing for no one apart from ourselves and we can't wait. Kickoff arrived and Croatia started superbly. Just eight minutes gone, a Nico Kratjar shot took goalkeeper Scott Carson by surprise. England nearly hit back instantly through Sean Wright Phillips. But they were leaving gaps at the back and Ivica Olic made it 2-0. Lampard pulled one back for England from the penalty spot. Then Peter Crouch finished in style to draw England level. For this was to be Croatia's night, and with 13 minutes to go, Mladen Petric struck a killer blow into England hearts. In a match they didn't need to win, Croatia had shown the world they have a team to be reckoned with. And they knocked out one of the big guns, England, on their own turf. It was like simply pure great football game. On Wembley, on the best stadium in the world, two really good teams. And I think we fully deserve to win because we, we were a much better side. And it was a shock for England. I ain't gonna say that we didn't deserve to be too upfront, but it was shockingly quite, quite unacceptable and quite easy, like not out of nowhere, like we, we I mean the second goal, the move from the Silva was the move of the game, you know, but but still it was like two nil after 15 minutes. I mean simply it was our night. Croatia fully deserved their place at the top of qualifying Group E. An impressive nine wins and two draws from their 12 games. Euro matches in Vienna will be held at the Ernst Happel Stadium. Austria's national ground holds just under 50,000 spectators and is rated as one of UEFA's five-star venues. We've got some really great stadiums here in Austria, like in Klagenfurt at the Wörthersee, here in Vienna, in Innsbruck and Salzburg as well. And these are all towns with a wonderful culture and have a great atmosphere. So whether it's coffee houses or a Schaus Waltz that grabs you, or if you've simply come for the football, you're guaranteed a great time in Vienna. In addition to the final, the Ernst Happel Stadium will also play host to all three of Austria's group games. Now we have a look at Poland, hoping to make an impact in Group B. Today we will be in heaven, Poland will get qualification to the Euro 2008. During my lifetime I, I haven't uh, seen anything like this. We're gonna win and that's all. We are the best in the world. We win matches, that's the most important part.
It's amazing, uh, not only uh, for the results, but uh, the way they, 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 they play sometimes their matches or part of their matches. It's amazing to see the level. In qualifying Group A, Poland put in a fantastic performance under Beanhacker. An early 2-1 win against group favourites, Portugal, showed the Poles really were a force to be reckoned with. I think the games against Portugal or the games against Belgium away, we showed that we are able to win with everybody. That Portugal win was followed by victory in Belgium. Beanhacker's hard work had paid off. Belief had been restored to the national team and a first ever appearance at the Euros was a real possibility. I think that was also an important game for us and uh, we showed that we can play football. They realized at that moment, hey, we can do it. And that was a key moment in, uh, yeah, in the job, yes. Yet in such a tight group, it all came down to Poland's penultimate game, this time at home to Belgium in November 2007. Fans flocked to Katowice to cheer their side on to what would be an historic qualification. If we win tonight, uh, we're going to qualify for the first time in our history for the European Championship. We can make history today if you win. Bean Hacker's side were delivering and the fans were responding. Poles had got used to being let down by their national side, but here was a chance of Euro qualification and the fans wanted it desperately. We hope we will win today and this, is, this will be our, the best celebration of the year. I think uh, we can mm, describe to the in Rio de Janeiro. Not quite the Rio Carnival perhaps, but all the same Poland's faithful fans were geared up for the biggest party of their lives. And Ebi Smolarek got the celebrations underway in the first half, pouncing just before half time to give Poland a deserved lead. Smolarek really was the difference for Poland. This was his second and ninth of the campaign, sealing a 2-0 win and a momentous victory for Leo Benhaka's men. A result that sent the fans into ecstasy, and it's a party that's still in full swing. We are really happy, and uh, we did a big thing, you know. We, uh, over the years, uh, uh, Polish uh, players tried to go to Europe, never got the success. And this time was, uh, yeah, beautiful. Party time for the players too. I think we go sleep uh, in one hour. <laughs> Poland held on for top spot in Group A, ahead of much fancied Portugal. A result which has made the rest of Europe sit up and take notice. Coming up, World Cup runners-up in 2006. How will France fare at this year's Euro finals? France. And once again, they face Italy. Can the World Cup holders conquer Europe as well as the world? First, they need to qualify from the group of death. The 9th of July 2006, a date no Italian can forget. The night the Azzurri won a fourth World Cup. Success in Europe will be a different proposition for the world champions, but the fans expect no less. Forza Italia! Forza Italia! Donadoni's Italy are strong. Everyone is slating him, but I don't criticise anyone. We're world champions, we're the best around. We won the World Cup. The world is bigger than Europe, so it'll be great to conquer Little Europe as well. We definitely expect to be European champions. <laughs> Yet this is a new Italy altogether. Marcino Lippi decided to bow out as a World Cup winner, making way for new coach Roberto Donadoni. Before the World Cup, few Italians gave their team a chance. But now, with great victories, come great expectations. 
We go into this tournament aiming to win it, because we've seen how good it is to win. We've experienced that, but we know it's not going to be easy. We've changed our coach, and our federation is going through a difficult time. But this shouldn't affect us. You'll see that they'll gel well with the new coach. He's a wise and pretty smart person, a good guy. The huge task of replacing Lippi fell to Roberto Donadoni, a legendary player for Italy and for Milan, but as a coach, virtually untested. Donadoni is a very serious professional who is doing a decent job. He doesn't have great experience. At club level, he's only ever managed Livorno, so he might lack a bit of history, a bit of experience. And he's also a very closed and reserved guy who keeps himself to himself. It's not that he isn't good, but in comparison to Lippi, he doesn't have the same sort of experience. He's very well liked by the players because he's very clear with his ideas and he holds himself in a way that the players like, treats all of them the same, doesn't have favourites. The qualifying competition didn't start well for Donadoni's Italy. A home draw against Lithuania, followed by a 3-1 defeat to France, a repeat of the World Cup final, of course, left the fans feeling somewhat underwhelmed by the new coach. Lippi is much better. He'll always be in our hearts. It was better with Lippi. I prefer Lippi. Italy's slow start to qualification left them with plenty of work to do. After Scotland shocked France in Paris, the Azzurri had then to travel to Hampden Park, Glasgow, for their penultimate game. Both teams needed a win to go through. No one expected that Scotland result in France, but that's what happened. Anything's possible in football. And so now our qualifying campaign's a little different, and we have to take each game as it comes. As a big game, a big match, but I'm sorry for you. Just Italy won, win. We're Italy. We play any game to win. And we'll go into this one looking for a win too. It had all come down to this one encounter. Donadoni described the game as Italy's cup final. They may have been more used to a World Cup final, but as the rain poured down on a wintry Glasgow night, the Italians knew that was the way to approach it. The Azzurri were ready for a fight, and an early advantage could be the key. It'll come down to who will be out of the blocks quickest, who will get an early goal. We're up against a focused, tough team, desperate to win. Wise words from Captain Cannavaro, and it was Luca Toni who delivered in the opening minutes. A typically clinical strike to stun the Scots. Advantage Azzurri. Scotland did equalise, but the Italians came through with a dramatic last-minute winner from Christian Panucci. Now, at last, for Donadoni's Italy, they could look forward to the European Championships. I think in a game as finely balanced as this evening's one, we had to put in a great performance. And we've shown tonight that we're ready to have a great European Championship. Having won the World Cup, to then play in the European Championship will be great. We'll enjoy this moment now and then look forward to the Euros. That result, followed by a 3-1 win over the Faroe Islands, gave Italy top spot in a tough Group B. Zurich, which will host three games in Group C, is a truly international city, with an overall population of a million people. It's often named as the city with the highest quality of life in the world. Well, life in Zurich is about to get even better. Fantastic. It's going to be crowded, of course, and um, full of people, yeah, and it's going to be amazing. For those lucky enough to live in the city, winter skiing in the Alps is right on the doorstep. While in summer, 
Lake Zurich's bars and beaches are the perfect place to enjoy Switzerland. I think the greatest uh, yeah, party will be here in Zurich. They like how we drink <laughs> and how we make parties. It's a lot of parties and clubs here, also bars. It will be full here, more than maybe 150,000 people. Zurich is famous throughout the world as one of the main financial centers, with two of the biggest banks based here, UBS and Credit Suisse. And after you've been to the bank, of course, there's a fantastic range of shopping to enjoy. And don't miss the famous chocolate, either. For the European final, Zurich is hosting three group games at their main stadium, the Letzigrund. Local clubs, Zurich FC and Grasshopper Zurich, both play their home games here. Stop, stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should be a really good atmosphere, a lot of partying, a lot of fun and a good football tournament. A uh, lot of different people from different countries. Uh, I like it, I think uh, I will have a good time and uh, I think the people here are looking forward to this, uh, to this uh, spectacle. No doubt about the main match here, a repeat of the World Cup final from 2006 on the 17th of June. So finally, it was the French who had the last laugh in qualification. And they'll be very familiar faces at the Euros this summer. Winners in 2000 and World Cup finalists last time around, Les Bleus will have just one target in mind. C'est destination Vienne. It may be destination Vienna now, and everyone assumed the French would qualify without a problem. But it didn't always look that clear cut for Les Bleus. Scotland, in particular, were a thorn in their flesh with 1-0 wins both in Glasgow and Paris. But while Scotland celebrated, Raymond Domenech's side dug deep and ground out the results that got them through. But make no mistake, Scotland had seriously troubled them. That's football. You get these kind of results. I've always said there are no easy games anymore. The Scots played a different kind of game to us and it was one that just didn't suit us. Against Scotland, France lost a match that they had to win. And the problem was that they lost twice to this same opponent, which was a bit odd because the main rival in the group was Italy. So that was a little strange, because France actually did very well, apart from these two freak results. Accidents, if you like. After losing to Scotland in Paris, the French campaign was in trouble. But next up were the Faroe Islands. And goals from the established stars, first Nicolas Anelka, then Thierry Henry, put the French into a winning position. This before the new generation made their mark. Karim Benzema and Hatem Ben Arfa on the score sheet in a 6-0 triumph. This new generation is starting to replace its predecessors. They're around 20 years of age and they have that winning mentality because they grew up with French teams that were winning things. When they were 10, France played in the World Cup final in 1998 and that changes your attitude. These are kids from a winning country. This new generation, particularly players like Benzema, they're beginning to replace some of the great players like Zinedine Zidane. Benzema and Ben Arfa have incredible technique and the rise has been amazing. I don't know how old he is, but Benzema is a bit like Messi, a little French Messi. Brilliant. For a 
while qualification had looked anything but secure. But after Scotland faltered in Georgia and France beat the Faroes and Lithuania, they were home and dry. Well, we never really doubted it, did we? So in the end, France qualified with a two-point cushion over Scotland. Coming up, Romania qualified for Euro 2008 with ease. Can the new generation of Romanians make an impression at the finals? And it's qualifying all over again. Holland faced Romania in the group stages. We look at how the Dutch made it through. It wasn't the most straightforward qualifying campaign for Holland, but Danny Kurverman's goal against Luxembourg was enough for them to book their place in the finals. So we can expect the likes of Clarence Seedorf, Edwin van der Sar and Dirk Kout in Bern, Switzerland, where Holland play all their group matches. And wherever those orange shirts happen to play, the Orange Army is sure to follow. But if the celebrations in Rotterdam came across as somewhat muted, that was because the Dutch had only won 1-0 against Luxembourg. We only scored once. I think we had 10 or 15 chances to score. And uh, if you fail to do that, you know, in the end, you could have uh, drawn against Luxembourg. The big countries, uh, you know, have very tough games against the, the small countries. And it's, uh, it's very difficult against uh, a tight defence to play. And, uh, but I think today we did well. We, we created chances, but we only scored one goal. Nevertheless, the campaign had started well. An away win in Luxembourg was followed by a convincing victory against Belarus. 3-0 the scoreline, with two from the Arsenal star Robin Van Persie and one from Liverpool's Dirk Kout. Six points in the bag after two matches and all was well. Belarus, 3-0, and uh, also a very clear game, three goals. I think in this, in this period, uh, if you win with three goals by, by, by nil in, in these kind of games, you're doing fine, I think. But there were difficult moments midway through the campaign as Van Basten's side started dropping points. First, they drew away in Bulgaria. Then in Rotterdam, Romania got away with a goalless draw. What can you say? Uh, we had a difficult game in Holland against them because they, are, uh, they played a very close game. It was a uh, good defensive uh, from, from the Romanians, we didn't create a lot of chances, and, uh, but we had the same uh, situation. We also didn't give away a lot of uh, occasions. You could say that Van Basten's squad is a work in progress. Ruud van Nistelrooy is there with his wealth of experience, while youngsters seem to be bursting through. Players like Klaas Jan Huntelaar and Ryan Babbel. Can it all come together in time? We started three years ago with a lot of new players, and I think uh, year after year it's getting better. And uh, the good part of, of Holland is that we didn't uh, take a lot of goal against. Uh, we didn't make a lot also, but that's the, the thing where we are still working on. And hopefully that's getting better in the next uh, yeah, year. I think people like uh, Klaas Jan Huntelaar, there are several young players in the, in, the, in the Dutch team and I think they will really start to grow during the championship and he will, they will be the next generation for the, for, the, for the next 10 years to come for, Dutch, uh, for the Dutch team. Holland's youngsters are some of the more prized assets of Europe's top clubs. But Van Basten will be glad they have the support from his older pros. We have a lot of players uh, who are under 23. Some players who are uh, over 30, and uh, I think it's a good mix. And uh, I think the younger guys, uh, who still have a lot of years uh, ahead of them, uh, you know, can be uh, only stronger. You know, the development will go, will go further, and uh, you know, in the future, we, uh, you know, they, uh, they're going to have a very strong team. Holland certainly seemed to have the right blend when Bulgaria came to the Amsterdam Arena last September. A fantastic free kick from Wesley Schneider. And a typically predatory strike from Ruud van Nistelrooy made it a healthy 2-0 scoreline for the Dutch. I think the game against Bulgaria was, was the best because they had to win in that game. 
to beat the Bulgarians in the end. And uh, they played very um, mature and, and a very, it was a very solid game. Despite losing to Romania in Constanta, Holland booked their ticket to the Euro finals with routine victories over Slovenia and Luxembourg. So Marco van Basten will be happy for now. But they did finish three points behind the Romanians, but they are due to play again in Switzerland. A journey to Switzerland's interior will take you to the country's capital. The city has a population of 140,000 people, but many more will flock to the banks of the Aar River when the tournament kicks off. The main Swiss parliament buildings are located in a central square called the Bundesplatz. Here in the city, is, uh, this is the federal place, and um, that, uh, the place over there that is called the Front. There are a lot of cafes and uh, restaurants there. The Stade de Suisse Vankdorf has a capacity of 32,000 and will host some of the most exciting games of the tournament. Holland are playing three matches here, but unfortunately I don't have any tickets for the games. Although I think there'll be big screens here so that everyone can watch these games together. We have the Italians playing here, so uh, we have a lot of Italians living here as well, so they'll have a big party here in this city, so it'll be really great. Holland will play all their group games here, taking on Italy, France and Romania. Here's Group C, the one they're calling the Group of Death. The whole of the country got a chance to see the Romanian team in qualifying. The campaign took them from Timisoara to Constanta on the Black Sea and back to the capital, Bucharest. The only real setback was throwing away a 2-0 lead at home to Bulgaria. But the Romanians made no mistake against Albania and Belarus. That, though, was the easy part. And you have uh, Netherlands. Uh, in, in that group and uh, you have Bulgaria it's always difficult but the, the first in the first place the whole football community in Romania said okay we can do it this time it's gonna be hard difficult we don't have to lose points against let's say smaller teams then we have to manage somehow the, the matches with Holland and playing against one of the best teams in the world in their own country was always going to be their toughest match but Viktor Pitserka's Romania were ready to fight for a result in Rotterdam for this qualification, we are in three. It's Romania, Bulgaria and, and Holland. And uh, the first game that we play here, we draw against Bulgaria. So we went to Holland not to lose. And we obtained a great result because uh, lately uh, Bulgaria lost over there. So it's an advantage for us. It was a brave display from the Romanians. They were equal to everything that Holland's international stars could throw at them. Yeah, it was important because we didn't lose there. So uh, they didn't win two points, we didn't lose two points. The Romanians didn't know, of course, that they would once again be drawn against Holland for the Euro finals. Looking ahead to the tournament, the performances against the Dutch will certainly boost their confidence, as they did in qualifying. That was a really important result just nil-nil, but it was a psychological boost and crucial for our unbeaten run. We played really well, and I really hope that this will be a key result in our qualification. A nil-nil draw may not sound the most emphatic result, but in terms of Euro 2008 qualifying Group G, that point gave Romania a real platform to build on. Psychologically, it was very important for the players to know that they can make a good result against one of the best teams in the world. They are a generation that has already reached its, uh, its peak, you know. They are a very mature team and I think this time they really shouldn't miss it because they have quality, you know. For this generation, uh, it's a problem in the sense that, that they, they, they never qualified as a generation. They qualified last time in 2000, some of them, Kivu, Mutu, some of the, the players, but along with, with the other, the golden generation, as we call it in Romania, with Haji, Jika Popescu, Dan Petrescu and the others. 
There is indeed only one point of reference for any Romanian national team, and that's the one that did so well in USA 94. Gheorghe Hagi, Gica Popescu and the Golden Generation. It's unavoidable to compare because uh, what they did, uh, you know, uh, there were uh, five or six final tournaments that they uh, qualified and then was uh, United States in 94 when they finished uh, five, they reached uh, quarterfinals. But in Constanta, one of Romania's holiday towns by the Black Sea, there was a real chance for the modern generation to make their mark. Holland were due in town, eager to impose their reputation on the group. Romania's fortunes, too, hung in the balance. A victory would all but secure qualification, while defeat might let Bulgaria in. The media were out in force, sensing that the Romanian challenge was reaching a critical point. Tomorrow we're going to play our, our game, and uh, even if the Dutch national team is favoured on paper, uh, today we're in 2007, and in football everything is possible. We're going to play our, our chance. For the whole of the Romanian squad, this was the moment of truth, and expectation was high. Well, I think this is uh, the, the most uh, important game for us. <laughs> if we will win, we, we will be there. The night of the match brought some of the foulest conditions a football match could be played in. And the locals, who sensed a historic night for Romanian football, were not to be disappointed as their team went on to victory in Constanta. A header by Dorin Goyan delivered a 1-0 victory and almost certain qualification. A real team performance in the Black Sea rain. Yes, in the end, that 1-0 victory was enough to get Romania through. And another couple of victories helped them top the group ahead of the favourites. Coming up, the Russians get there in the end with Gus Hiddink. We take a close look at their eventful road to Austria. And Viva España! Is this the tournament that Spain finally turned potential into success? It was fiesta time in Las Palmas, as Spain eased into the Euro 2008 finals, beating a brave Northern Ireland side by the only goal in the Canary Islands. In fact, the Spaniards had already booked their place in the finals. This Wednesday night in November was all about celebrating one more name on the list of finalists for Austria and Switzerland. Mission accomplished. It's fantastic to have finished top of the qualifying group. And the way we did it gives us a real confidence boost. A deflected strike by the midfield maestro, Xavi, delivered another three points. And satisfaction for Luis Aragonés. Winning is always important in football, and after that, victories give you the chance to work on your style of play. So, I'm pleased to have won against a Northern Ireland side that has always made it difficult for us. We're top of the group, which is important for us, and it's good to make the fans happy too. The Spanish both started and finished qualification with routine victories. In September 2006, Fernando Torres, David Villa and Luis Garcia fired the home side to a 4-0 win against Liechtenstein, and the Spanish qualification was on course. It's always good to get off to a winning start. Against that kind of team, there's always an expectation to score a lot of goals, but it's never easy to score that many, so we were pleased. So far, so good, but then the flight path to Vienna hit some unexpected turbulence. A visit to Belfast delighted only the Northern Ireland fans as Spain lost 3-2. Then in Stockholm, it was the Swedish fans who were celebrating a 2-0 victory, with the disappointed Spanish nation left to wonder what had happened. Well, what a drama. We lost two games in a row and our qualification was in serious danger. And what brought us together then was the whole question of Luis Aragonés' future. 
We all thought that these were the last minutes Luis Aragonés would be in charge of the national team. But the Federation persuaded him to stay. And after that, we haven't looked back. In the last 13 matches, Spain have won 11 and drawn two. Losing in Belfast and Stockholm was hard for the Spanish fans to take, but the players themselves didn't give in to the pessimism. The big mistake, or at least the first slip-up we made, was losing in Belfast. But perhaps it was all actually a blessing in disguise, as it helped us come together, become a little bit more humble about things and made us a better team. Everyone was on a big downer, but we knew that wasn't right and that it was just a question of getting the right results. Well, the truth always comes out in the end, and thankfully that reflected well on us. Back on the qualification trail, Spain were beginning to put the results together with a settled side. There were victories over Denmark, Iceland and Latvia, and Spain remained unbeaten for the rest of the campaign. I think that one of the key factors was that the manager saw things clearly. He always managed to calm us down and gave us confidence. That really brought us together and got us all working for the team. After they were over the early problems, the Spanish were pretty much unstoppable, finishing the group on a nine-match unbeaten run and topping the section ahead of Sweden. Welcome to Austria, welcome in Österreich. This is Innsbruck in the Tyrol region of the Alps. It's the gateway to Austria and the country's gateway to Europe. Innsbruck was literally the town built on the bridge over the River Inn. It was considered to be of strategic importance by the Roman Empire, among others. Next summer, we'll see thousands of football fans arriving in the area to enjoy the festival Euro 2008. Willkommen in Austria. Willkommen in Österreich. Welcome to Austria. Willkommen in Innsbruck. Willkommen in Austria. The Tivoli Nur Stadium has nearly doubled its capacity to be able to welcome 30,000 fans this summer. A good job too, because there'll be huge support from Spain, Russia and Sweden. If it's in Innsbruck, it's a town where the Olympic Games were twice. And so it's, yeah, it's a, a big moment. I think a lot of people will watch it. We have a beautiful land here, beautiful country here, and I hope they enjoy it here in, uh, in Austria. Next up, Russia, who face a tough time in Group D. No wonder the Russian celebrations in Andorra were so wild. Theirs was a long and arduous road to Austria that went right down to the wire. With Croatia pulling away at the head of the table, a real struggle was developing between Russia and England. Both sides had suffered bad results against Macedonia, but the real groupie joker was turning out to be Israel. They got a goalless draw against England in Tel Aviv before taking points off Russia in Moscow. Then, in September 2007, the Russians arrived at Wembley. This was England's most convincing performance of the whole campaign. And a 3-0 win should have provided a platform for qualification. Konstantin Zidianov did get the ball into England's net, but his effort was disallowed. Disappointing, but Hiddink and Russia were taking one match at a time. When we were playing halfway to qualification, we said, hey, we have to win Macedonia. And then you got the next crucial game, which, is, uh, which was England. Yeah? In Wembley, we played rather OK. We did not materialize. Our, our play, OK, you lose. And then the next very crucial game is, is England, England in uh, Luzhniki. Of course, uh, all Russian people was uh, very upset 
but all Russian people uh, hope that Russia can play in Luzhniki better. Of course, McLaren and Hiddink would meet again in Moscow, where Group E would take another major twist. Wayne Rooney put England ahead, but then Hiddink played his major trump card. He brought on Roman Pavlyuchenko, who scored twice to give Russia an historic victory. This is, just shows the technical brilliance of Hiddink. They're 1-0 down going into half-time, but he sort of gives them a team talk, um, relaxes the players, um, spots weaknesses, and exploits those weaknesses. With Russia having dealt England a massive blow in Moscow, the focus of the group moved once again to Israel and Tel Aviv. Here, the locals were ready for another Group E twist. For Israel, the game has no importance anymore, has no meaning. But suddenly Israel is involved in a, such a, you know, a, a poker game between two other teams. The Israeli team is the dealer in this game. It's an event, nothing more than an event. We feel ourselves a little bit uh, important now because, you know, we can mix and, in the game and can uh, decide who is going uh, to the next uh, stage in the Euro. That's all. Israel had indeed become the power brokers in Group E. The question now, in front of their own fans, would their national pride spur them on to beat Russia? And so do England, an enormous favour. I want to win on Israel and I hope if England to win. Then there was a Russia connection in Israel. Nearly a million Russians already lived here and thousands more joined them for the match. Very important. The most important thing in today in the whole year. I believe that if we win this game, we should win this game. Uh, we will qualify. But England weren't without their own support in Tel Aviv. We are hopeful. We are hopeful. Israel got a great record here. They've lost twice in 24 games. There's no reason they got a draw out in Russia. There's no reason why they can't get a draw here. Do us a favour. Tal Ben Haim, nil nil. That's all we want. Keep a clean sheet and we're going to Austria and Switzerland. Come on, Israel! Come on! Come on, Come on Israel! And it was the English who celebrated a miracle in the Holy Land as Russia faltered to a 2 1 defeat. For Hiddick's team, it seemed the dream was over. Of course. We are all very, very disappointed. That's normal. But I think the uh, future is there in, in, uh, in the national team. There was, of course, one last hope for Hiddink. While Russia were away to Andorra, could Croatia beat England at Wembley? I expect them to win. They, they have a team to, uh, to go for the win. So I expect them to win as well. It turned out to be an amazing night in London as Croatia stormed to a 2-0 lead within 15 minutes. Meantime, against Andorra, Russia did what was expected of them. A goal from Sichev, enough for victory. And back at Wembley, Miladin Petric fired in Croatia's third and winning goal. They had beaten England and Russia were through. It was hitting squad had squeezed past England by just a point and could look forward to the summer in Austria and Switzerland. Coming up, the holders, Greece. Can the impossible happen? Can the Greeks retain the European Championship trophy? And Sweden have qualified yet again. The Scandinavians made short work of getting there, but are they ready for the real pressure of Euro 2008? Qualification got underway for Sweden back in September of 2006 with solid results against two of the group's weaker nations. Latvia were beaten 1-0 in Riga before Liechtenstein were brushed aside 3-1 at the Rosunda. So with six points in the bag, Sweden prepared for one of the big tests of Group F. Spain arrived in Stockholm with a fearsome reputation, but the Swedes were undaunted. Spain was a very difficult opponent beforehand. Everyone was scared of that game, figured, hey, that, that's going to be the most difficult game. The first surprise came after just 10 minutes when rising Swedish star Johan Elmander put the home side one up. But worse was to come for Luis Aragones and the Spaniards. The goal against Spain was, uh, was a vital one and um, it came in a, in a perfect time for us. Uh, they were very close of scoring 1-1. Uh, it was just 
yeah, seven or eight minutes left of the game. And um, we saved the ball on the, on the line. The attacker after that, we scored the 2 0, and, and the game was, um, was ours. So that was a special goal. Away from the Rosunda Stadium, Sweden beat Iceland, but then suffered their first setback of the qualifying campaign in Belfast. The Northern Ireland game, we gave that game away. Uh, that was the completely opposite to, this, to the Spain game. Uh, I, th I think we were too confident. Defeat in Northern Ireland was hardly ideal preparation for perhaps the most eagerly awaited fixture of the whole group. Sweden made the short trip to Copenhagen to face neighbours Denmark. Well, that's a poor backheader. It sets up an early chance here for Sweden, and it's through the legs of Sorensen, and Sweden have taken the lead. Oh, it's well struck, and it's a second goal for Sweden. Wilhelmsen to run at the defender, and oh, he's just gone round him with ease, cuts it back. Oh, and it's number three, and it's Elmander again. And they're cutting Denmark to pieces. It was amazing for about 50, 55 minutes. Then it was the uh, half, last half, half hour it was uh, extremely tough. Chance here for Agger! Everything in that game happened. I think we got some sloppy goals in the beginning and then they got some sloppy goals in their end. Here's Jon Dahl Thomason. He's got a chance to get a goal for Denmark, and he has. And they're back in it. Andresen. Oh, it's an equaliser! And would you believe it? It's 3 3. It was a fantastic game. It was a high tempo. It was a lot of goal scoring chances. It was six goals scored, and uh, then we had the penalty. So up till then, I think it was one of the most intensive matches I have experienced with the Swedish national team. And well, who was that? Was a fan who came on, wasn't it, and, and had a go at the referee? We didn't realize what was going on. We we just stood there and thinking, what is this? Is it a penalty or is it a free kick? And then we had to go in. The German referee is bringing the teams off with the score at 3-3, having been assaulted by a fan after showing the red card to a Danish player, and he's refusing to continue the match. The game has ended in a victory for Sweden by three goals to nil. They've been awarded that victory by the referee, and they now move to 15 points in this group and go into first place. Four days later, the game against Iceland at the Rosunda was a little more straightforward, but the three points were just as crucial. Iceland uh, have a lot of good players, but we got lucky, we got an early goal, uh, and they still made it hard. They didn't, uh, even though we were 1-0 up, they didn't want to go forward, but then we scored two um, late goals in the first half, which practically killed the game, and then we played some excellent football the rest of the game, 1-5-0. Three months later, and Sweden welcomed their Danish neighbours to Stockholm. The night was a mix of Scandinavian passion and terrible conditions in Stockholm, with neither side ultimately happy with the outcome. No revenge for Denmark, and for Sweden, no win to clinch a place in the finals. Although with results elsewhere falling their way, the goalless draw did suit the Swedes more. Looking at the group after tonight, it looks. Uh, I can't see how we, we're going to miss the championship, so uh, we're very satisfied with the, the results today. We take one game at a time and we don't think about the other teams, we think about ourselves and hopefully we're on a good way now and uh, we should continue like we have done so far and uh, it looks good. The results did pan out in Sweden's favour, and despite losing to Spain in November, they qualified comfortably. Salzburg's biggest claim to fame is that it's the birthplace of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. So there'll be some highbrow culture to complement the football come the summer.
Basically, it's the birth town of Mozart, so this is one of the main reasons why people come in here. And if Mozart's not your cup of tea, then how about the sound of music? It's just one of the most well-known movies on Salzburg, so actually I sometimes think it plays a more important role to the world than to Salzburg itself. But the locals love their football too. And for the Euro finals, the city will host their three group games at the home of the Red Bulls. The local side are the 2007 Austrian champions. And unusually, their ground has an artificial playing surface. For the Euro, it's only allowed to play on natural grass. So uh, we will leave this uh, artificial pitch and put a natural grass above this pitch here. Here in Salzburg, current European champions Greece will take on Sweden, Russia and Spain. Next up, from Group D, defending their title, Greece. It was a footballing miracle. Ranked 100 to 1 outsiders before the tournament began, Greece shocked the footballing world and won Euro 2004. It's not just a Greek football team that's made history. In fact, history is what Greece's ancient culture is all about. Athens's classical architecture is all that remains from the days when the country led the world in philosophy, science and the arts. Then again, modern-day Athens still has plenty going for it, both in terms of culture and football. But the life here can be something of a distraction to the committed football star. If you have lived in Athens, uh, you cannot change this city with uh, all the cities of the world. It's a city that uh, has everything. You can go to the mountain, you can go to the sea. One million options, you have to enjoy yourself. We have very, very good food, a very good nightlife. If you are not disciplined and you live in Athens, you cannot play football. But there's never too much chance of indiscipline with German coach Otto Rehagel in charge. Just as he did four years ago, Ray Hagel has assembled a committed and organised side. And there was no better sign of that commitment than a way to group rivals Norway in September of last year. The Ullival Stadium in Oslo was packed to the rafters for a crucial encounter. And this one turned out to be quite a thriller. Karagounis. And Greece have taken the lead. Kyriakos has got the goal. Norway playing yet more pressure. The goalkeeper's come to try and claim it. He hasn't got there. And John Carew is claiming the equalising goal. Karagounis will take. Whipped in. And this time, they've got a second goal. Kyriakos, I thought, had been denied then by Opdal. It was a magnificent save initially by the goalkeeper, but Kyriakos, who gave Greece the lead, has now made it 2-1. Risa! Magnificent from Yonan Risa! That is a fantastic goal! Two two, the final score, with Greece perhaps happier with the point. After Norway came Bosnia, potentially difficult opponents, but three points secured in a three two win. Greece needed now just a point to make the finals, and victory could be secured in enemy territory. They had to travel to Turkey with a chance to secure qualification in Istanbul. So, for each and every one of the country's many daily sports newspapers, there was only one story in town. Turks, here we come. Turkey had celebrated a 4-1 win in Greece, and as far as German coach Ray Hagel was concerned, this was now the chance for revenge. The, uh, the Turks didn't think about us in Athens. They beat us. And at the end of the day, we have to make up for that, if we can. The coach had his wish. It would be the Greek fans singing after this one. A nervy match, Turkey couldn't find a breakthrough. And with just 10 minutes to go, Avanatidis struck to earn a 1-0 win. 
Greece had qualified for Euro 2008 on rival territory. We celebrate from today the, the ticket uh, to the Euro 2008. It's, uh, it's fantastic because uh, we took uh, revenge as well in an athletic manner. No problems then for the current holders. They finished in top spot and by an impressive seven-point margin. As for their chances at this year's finals, well, of course, the element of surprise will have gone for Greece. But if they do fail to retain their crown, it won't be for a lack of effort. We have uh, strong possibilities to, to go well. Uh, we have belief and uh, we have nothing to lose and uh, we are the champions as well so uh, uh, we have to go there to defend our title as well and uh, it's, it's not uh, going to be easy uh, job for us everybody want to to beat greece and uh, we have to give 100 percent in every month thanks for watching destination vienna france